Um, yeah, my disclosures. So um, the trans auxiliary approach has been for me a true uh, game changer. Uh, for the patient, it provides a, a, a superb cosmetic result. From the front view, you don't see any incision. You have to ask the patient to lift up the right arm if you really want to see the incision, but it's also very good for the surgeon. In fact, it can provide a beautiful exposure of the mitral valve, of the aortic, of the tricuspid valve. You can perform more easily uh, minimally invasive uh, uh, art valve uh, uh, operation. In fact, uh, it's all about where you enter the chest. If you enter the chest laterally, you end up with, very three, with three very good conditions to work direct view without the need of any uh, camera. And uh, look at these images. What you see is that the, the trajectory to the valve is really perpendicular. You see all the valve, P1, P2, P3, are on the same plane. This plane is perpendicular to me. You also see and can appreciate that I'm very close to the valve. The distance from the surgeon, from the chest wall, to the valve is close. So you, you, you end up with the valve very close to you. You are perpendicular. And also ergonomics, are like robotics, are very good. My eyes are in the middle, and my instruments one come from the right, the right instruments come from the right, and the left instrument come from the left. You are in perfect condition to operate a direct view. Why is it like that? Because valves are naturally oriented towards the armpit. So basically, where the endoscopic surgeon will place the camera with the instruments that more commonly are coming from another incision, so where they put the camera, the endoscope, we make the incision to get this nice perpendicular trajectory to the valve. And we are able to make the valve closer to the chest wall by placing, applying some stay suture on the pericardium. So we normally get the valve at the 10 centimeters distance from, from the chest wall, as you can see in this uh, uh, picture. So again, after you place your annular sutures, you are in front of the valve, you are perpendicular, you are close to it, and you have perfect ergonomics to work. And this is uh, uh, true for the mitral, this is true for the tricuspid, this is true for the aortic valve. As we enter the chest in front of the, up, uh, of the right superior pulmonary vein, we are really in front of the transverse sinus, so to get access to the transverse sinus is easy, and so it is easy to manage the left appendage. We can do myxoma, we can do ASD surgery, we can combine all of them together. So why, was, why is transaxillary game changer to me? Because it's associated with super cosmetics, because it's associated with beautiful valve exposure. At this point, you may say, you can have this with robotic, you can have this with endoscopic, but this is what transaxillary, in my opinion, add. It is a surgeon-friendly, operation. There is no learning curve for the endoscope. There is no management of the endoscope. You go back to direct view surgery. And this is effective in reducing, minimizing patient selection and surgeon selection. So I truly believe this has a great potential for minimally invasive cardiac surgery expanded indication. In fact, sometimes I hear the transaxillary is for the beginner. For sure. For sure, it's for beginner because it's easy to start with this approach. But I think it may also, an intermediate surgeon may benefit of that because they will do less patient selection. They will face the more complex valve. They will add the tricuspid. They will add the AFib ablation. They will add the left appendage management. And they will do everything faster. And the expert will do almost 100% minimal invasive cardiac surgery. They will do double, triple valves at the faster velocity. So I was asked to uh, show a, a case, and this is a typical sunny Sunday uh, uh, in Ancona. The plan was to go here. It sounds like an horror movie, eh? the beginning of an horror movie, eh? but uh, I knew this uh, plan was not applicable because we got on Saturday evening a referral for a lady, 73 years old lady. She had a transient ischemic attack and the CT scan we found they found a minor ischemic hemorrhagic embolic lesion. The patient was asymptomatic. She, was, she had fever despite the antibiotic therapy, and they sent me on WhatsApp this echo, and uh, then I knew that I was not going to the sea uh, the, the following uh, day. So we, uh, you, see the, you see a huge vegetation. This is the intercommissional view. You see that the central medial part of the valve is a big problem. You see two jets 
you better see the two jets here, one at the level of the commissure, one at the level of, uh, of A2. Uh, this is the 3D uh, reconstruction, and this patient also had a moderate uh, tricuspid regurgitation with the severely dilated annulus. So we are in the OR. Uh, this is uh, the incision for uh, NNR. So this is how we place patients when they have a quite abundant breast. Uh, in terms of perfusion, we can rate the femoral artery, the femoral vein, the jugular vein. We are always normothermic. We use the nidocardioplegia. We use in pulsatile flow. This is an ongoing study. And uh, we are operating now. So this is a very important moment, the opening of the pericardium. We like to open the pericardium on the top of the ascending aorta, as you would do in full sternotomy surgery, for two reasons. Because the posterior pericardial curtain will keep away the lung. We're not using single lung ventilation. And second, because we want to apply um, pericardial stay sutures, pericardial stay sutures and pull to make the valve get close to the operating surgery. So this is good to avoid um, phrenic nerve injury. So we apply three stitches anteriorly, four pericardial stage switches posteriorly, and you see the right atrium is almost touching the chest wall and the aorta is, the, is there. Why I like uh, the transaxillary? Because you enter in front of the, up, of the right superior pulmonary vein. At the that level, you are at short, equal distance from everything, from the superior vena cava, to the inferior vena cava, the right atrium is in front of you, the mitre will be in front of the pulmonary vein, you have the aorta, you have the transverse sinus there. So it becomes very easy to snare the superior vena cava, the inferior vena cava, the aortic needle will be there, and, and, and the same we will do for the aortic clamping. So this was the first look at the valve. And sometimes, you know, when you look at this valve, the first basic instinct you have is to ask your nurse scissors and knife cut it off and replace, put a valve. But uh, exposure will be completed after we place the annular switches because the valve will get even closer to you. You see that the medial and central part of the valve is not so bad. We know we have big problems on the central uh, medial part of the, um, of, the, uh, of the valve, and in particular at the level of the commissure. When you look at these images, please focus only, always ask yourself, I, am I perpendicular? Am I close? What are, what are the ergonomics of the operating surgeons here? So you see the, 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 the commissure. So uh, we start on with, with the brimment of the valve. We start to clean the valve. We do this with forcer, with knife, with scissor. We do that at the level of the anterior and posterior mitral leaflet. And then we take a second look to the valve. And you see that the valve is getting better and better. Of course, we know we have a problem at the level of the posteromedial uh, commissure. So we assess the commissure again. There was, a, now I can show it to you very nicely, but there was a kind of a P2, P3 cleft due to the infection, and also the commissure is completely gone over there. So we decided to keep it simple and to close the cleft P2, P3. This is what I'm doing. To close the uh, commissure with an edge to edge uh, technique. The valve was large enough, no problem to do that. So we test the valve again and the valve looks better. We know we have a second jet to uh, address uh, at the level of A2. And in fact, there was a kind of uh, perforation. The free margin that I'm grasping with my forceps was very uh, poor in quality, so I decided to divide it and then to reconstruct it with a, with a proline uh, stitch. We check the valve. The valve seems to be working nicely, so we just have to put a ring at this moment, and uh, we use the memo ring. Let me spend a few words about that. What I like of this um, ring is the technology that there is behind, beyond the ring, the nitinal cell structure. So this is a semi-rigid valve, but it's a semi-rigid ring, but it's more flexible than the other semi-rigid, so it has the potential to offer a better uh, diastolic function, increasing the annular orifice, and also it will follow the contraction of the heart, increasing the length of coaptation of the leaflets after your uh, repairs. And then uh, uh, this was the last water test. The valve was nicely working. There were no leaks, so we're pretty satisfied. So we go to the tricuspid valve. How to expose the tricuspid valve? We do a transverse atriotomy. We use two stay sutures, one on the posterior edge and the other one on the anterior edge of the atriotomy. Then we use a normal uh, atrium retractor. We adjust a little bit the field, the placing, putting down the cardioplegia cannula and the clamp, and you see how we can expose the valve. Again, the concept, you are perpendicular, you close, you can work 
direct view. And this is uh, the final result of the Preco speed valve repair. So uh, this was the post-operative echo, uh, the intercommissural and the long axis view, um, no leaks, uh, very long cooptation, and the tracker speed was also very nice. The clamp time for this operation was 80 minutes. The patient was extubated five, four hours later, and two days after was transferred to the ward. Uh, after six days, we were ready to transfer this patient to the uh, infective disease department when she had a stroke. And this was the hemorrhage we found at the level of the uh, brain. Uh, the patient died two days afterwards. So uh, the key message is from this um, case. Uh, Transaxillary approach, I think this is very important, enhances minimal exposure without increasing the surgical complexity. This is the key point. So all surgeons at all different levels can do more minimal invasive cardiac surgery. Endocarditis surgery can be very complex, but very often it is less complex than expected. So the suggestion is to take your time, the breathe the valve, and find solution. And it will end up that in the vast majority of cases, you can use basic techniques, resection, cord, edge to edge, ring, to fix the vast majority of the valves. And this is the last conclusion with endocarditis. A good operation doesn't always mean, with regret, a good outcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marco. This is a, an excellent demonstration of how you kind of approach the valve in a staged fashion and don't get too excited when you first take the first look and kind of work at it and see what you have. Step and by step. E each step gives you more confidence of it. Um, so uh, the, the, any questions for Dr. Gisano? Uh, yep. Pain management for your incision. Pain management. Yeah, we always do, 100%. I think it's three years that we always do in pain management. Uh, we do it with um, with local regional anesthesia technique. So we're doing the um, serratus block, all cases. And also for the mini stenotomies, and now also for the full stenotomy, we're doing intercostal blocks. So we very, I truly believe that a painless operation is a less invasive operation for the patient. For surgeons, probably doesn't, they, they don't really care because they're not suffering pain. But if we take the patient perspective, uh, this is what I try to say many times. So minimal invasive is not just a small incision. That's the surgeon perspective. Pain management is good part, an important part of a nice minimal invasive intervention. Truly believe that. Yeah, uh, I would recommend to you to go to the fourth intercostal space if you're doing tricuspid, and to go to the third if you're doing aortic, aortic third, tricuspid fourth. If you if you're doing mitral, we've been you know over the last two years we fourth or third. The third intercostal space is the wider intercostal space we have. So more and more I'm. I'm, 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 I'm approaching the mitral valve from the third. So when I go to combine aortic and mitral, 99.9% .9 it will be the third in the cost space. I use the retractor only one minute, and that is the minute that I'm opening the pericardium. And I'm using the retractor not, of course, to, to spread a little bit the ribs, but also I use it to to expose the distal ascending aorta to open the pericardium up there. And after I've done the pericardial opening, I remove it, and then I, I just work without. And this is possible because the intercostal space laterally is white, and tissue is soft tissue is very soft. So it's incredible how nicer is the exposure from here to here. I'm talking, I'm thinking about the RT buffs. Uh, we abandoned basically the anterior trachotomy in favor of the transaxillary, and that has a lot to do with the fact the intercostal space laterally is more. Um, let's say it, it's bigger, it's wider. And my last question is: Do you use transthoracic clamp at you, you Signet. Th through the incision or from the second or first? Intercourse? Yeah, this is a single incision operation. So we we have one incision, then we have the two drains, one small and one medium, let's say size. Uh, we use the Signet clamp, which is a it is not the chit food, it is flexible. And I can say I find many advantages, not just that you're doing 
less holes, let's say, that can bleed afterwards, but also because, uh, um, you know, you minimize all kind of conflicts that you may have with cannulas, retraction of the right, and also exposure of the transverse sinus, because when we clamp with the flexible clamp, we rotate, we move the clamp in the assistant side, and that will rotate a little bit the ascending aorta, and we will get, you will have a better let's say, entry, uh, a better exposure of the transverse sinus, which is in front of you. Any other questions for Marco? Marco, I have a question. You started by saying that this is a great approach for beginners. And the question is, you're obviously not a beginner, but you've stayed with this approach. And what is the evolution between being very lateral in the transaxillary uh, uh, region versus kind of moving more medially, which we're going to see uh, in other presentations? What do you think the advantages, uh, disadvantages of either technique? Um, I am in love with this approach, so I'm really biased. I'm the last person you should ask this, uh, this question. But I didn't say this is for beginners. I said this is for beginners, but also for the more experienced surgeons, because they, at all levels, I see that might be some kind of selection, unless you are Asan Balki, Mattia Glauber, Dr. Weyman, Marco Solinas, and you no, know, at all levels there is a kind of select the sick patient. You want to be, you know, mm, and then you have the trico speed, and you make it. You have to do the whole job. So I think this is uh, simpler. This is faster. This helps minimizing selection. Uh, at the moment, I'm very happy. I think the mitral valve is much easier than the aortic valve, especially if you remain with a small incision. I don't like bigger incision, but if you do it, you really, what I say is you can put your heads inside, you know, and, and, uh, and uh, yeah. I, I have a very small question for you. Uh, what is your approach in redo patients? So uh, yeah. you are surely doing also redo cases Yeah, I've done, uh, I've done a few. I've done a few. I've, I've, I've managed them in different ways. Sometimes it has been possible to uh, put a clamp in the transverse sinus because you know in primary operation there is a small manipulation of the transverse sinus so you can you probably sometimes you don't find additions so you can put your clamp i've done others with uh, with the, on the beating guard uh, i've done some with the ventricular fibrillation i always say myself you should start with the endo balloon but i'm not started yet so uh, maybe next year i'll give you a different answer <laughs> marco i want to congratulate you this is a phenomenal okay. session my name is Manny Subramini. I know you. I watch all of the ISMIC, ISMIC papers and abstract every year. A couple of years ago, um, I forgot who, but they presented a transaxial approach for a congenital heart. Fantastic. For congenital. A tetralogy of alone, beautiful operation. So through this insertion. And so, do you think? This insertion is still good for that? Or not? Yeah, I'm not a pediatric. I know so you're not I'm not the doing the congenital, but I know many surgeons that are doing the congenital with this approach, especially in India. For sure, they, they're using this approach, so it seems this, to be a very versatile. I think for each, like China, Chinese or I forgot okay. who, uh, Vietnamese, presented a transaxial approach. I was very impressed uh, by looking at that. You know, I'm not sure the details of that, but it was a transaxial. Yep. Exactly the same uh, insertion lines you have, in, in, um, uh, I think to answer the question of Sam Balki or other people, always ask, you know, you are the experienced surgeon, you know, how about the learner? But the experienced surgeon starts from a, somewhere in the starting point. So don't ask the question, okay? People, <laughs> young people can start by themselves. So I, I do not believe in that. You got to learn somewhere. Every procedure, everything in our life is learning. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Subramanian. One last quick question, yeah. uh, Mishra. So just, just comment. So what Marco said about congenital, yeah, I have some experience of using this approach for PAPBC and sinus venosis. Yes. And this is excellent. We are there. We can, you know, the, the problem is that when we do, uh, you know, the open case, we have to cannulate that. If the SB, if the superior for the vein is a little high up in the, in the vena cava, then this is the best approach because we are connecting from here and we are there. We can augment the SVC to avoid any constriction so far. Us, I have not had any experience with the 
uh, technology, but for PBC and, 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 and AST, this is a good approach. Thank Excellent. You. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Marco. Thank, Thank you. you. Our, our next speaker is.